Hello, I'm the developer of the Horror Engine. In this video, I will guide you through the input settings. When you navigate to the input section of the project settings, you will see the default input action and axis bindings. However, if you edit them from here, all settings will revert to the defaults as soon as you press the play button. Let's change the jump action key to X and see what happens. As you can see, the jump action key is still set to the spacebar, even though we have made changes. This is because the horror engine reads the default input action and axis bindings from a defined structure called input settings. Therefore, we need to set the defaults from this structure instead of the project settings. When we do the same from here, the changes will be applied. Now let's see what happens when we rebind a key from in-game, and then change it again from the structure. As you can see, if a change is made within the game, settings are read from a save file, and the default settings are ignored. But note that, in the development stage, save files are temporary. When you package and publish the game, players will start playing with the default settings you set in the structure. To avoid confusion and restore the in-game settings to the way you set them in the structure, simply press the Restore Defaults button. Alternatively, you can delete the save file named Settings in the project files. All of these options you see here can be edited in the Settings widget blueprint. Let me show you how to delete the lines you don't need. First, let's find the Settings widget blueprint in the Content Browser. Under the Hierarchy tab, you can see that the settings are divided into three main categories. By clicking on the eye icon, you can toggle the visibility of the widget you want to edit. When you expand the widget, you will see that each row is grouped into an overlay. Let us assume that the game you are designing does not include any equipment other than the flashlight. In this case, you will want to remove all the other equipment options from the settings. To do this, let's select all the other equipment-related overlays, except the one that contains the flashlight. To avoid confusion, move them all to the bottom and set the visibility option under the details panel to collapsed. Optionally, you can make them invisible by clicking on the eye icons to remember the changes you made. But even if you don't, they won't be visible during gameplay anyway, as they are set to collapsed. As you can see, equipment other than the flashlight no longer appears under input settings. However, they are still not disabled. Even though they are hidden from the input settings, their functions will still work. Therefore, the game will try to activate the equipment when the corresponding buttons are pressed. To prevent this, open the Horror Engine Blueprint and navigate to the input graph. Break the link of the corresponding input actions of the equipment you want to disable. After this step, they will all be disabled. So what about adding a new feature to the Horror Engine and adding an input option for it? I think it would be cool if the character would suddenly turn around when the X button is pressed. If you think so too, let me show you how to do it. First, let's navigate to the project settings and add a new action mapping. Let's name it something like Turn Back and set its key to X. Then open the Horror Engine character blueprint and search for the input action event called Turn Back that we just created. Before moving on to the next step, we can use a print string to make sure everything is working correctly. After this great success, we can now start integrating this input action into the input settings. To do this, we need to do the same thing in the input settings structure that we just did in the project settings. Add a new variable, set its type to input action key mapping, and its container type to array. Make sure you give it the same name as in the project settings, otherwise it will not work correctly. Now you can set its key as X. The next step is to add this new input action to the settings widget blueprint. Instead of creating a new row, we can duplicate an existing row and move on. Let's use the jump row to do this. When we expand the duplicated overlay, we see two buttons named Jump 0 and Jump 1. Before renaming these buttons, 
make sure that you are editing the duplicated one and not the original one. Under the overlay we duplicated, let's rename everything that appears as jump to turn back. Now that we have completed this step, the only thing left to do is to make these new buttons functional. Before we go any further, let me give you a hint. I know that understanding a complex blueprint created by someone else and adding new features to it is a challenging task. I can say that the most effective method in such a scenario is to trace back to an existing feature. I often use this method even in my own projects to help me remember what I have done before. Now I will show you how we can achieve our goal using the same method. We already have many buttons that are already functional, such as jump. Let's click on the jump button and switch to graph editing mode. We can see that the button we just selected is also selected here. Let's see where it's used by right-clicking it and selecting find references. The find results tab shows us that it is only used in one place. Let's double-click it and see where it takes us. And here we have found it. We see that besides the buttons we duplicated, there is also a structure. In this case, we need to duplicate and rename it as well. Next, let's copy all the jump-related nodes we see here and then replace them with the ones we created for turn back. Our work here is done. But there is one more thing we should not overlook. The structure we just noticed and duplicated may be used in other places. Let's see where else it's used. Not surprisingly, we can see that it is also used in a few other places. So let's move on. Here we came across a node called Switch On Name. It has a pin for all input actions except turn back. To fix this, let's press the Add Pin button and give the newly added pin the same name as the input action we set for turn back. As we just did, let's copy all the jump related nodes we see here and then replace them with the ones we created for turn back. Let's move on to the next. If we look at the input setting structure here, we can see that the turn back array is empty. Just like the others, let's link the turn back structure to it. Let's move on to the next. Let's move on to the next. It seems that we have already modified this place at the beginning. As a final step, let's link the turn back structure to the empty array. Now we can finally compile and save the blueprint and see if everything works properly. The X button still works, which is a good sign. As you can see, the turn back action key is set to X, which means we made it. But just to be sure, let's try to change it and see what happens. Now that everything is working properly, we can start designing our character's new movement ability. To do this, let's go back to the Horror Engine character blueprint and get rid of the print string function. We need to use the get controller function and link it as a target to the set control rotation function to rotate the player character. The get control rotation returns the current rotation of the character. If we right click on its return value pin and select the split struct pin option, it will split the struct pin as X, Y, and Z. Since we only want to rotate the character on the Z axis, we should link the X and Y pins without making any changes, while adding 180 to the current value of Z.
As you can see, the character now rotates 180 degrees on the Z-axis when we press the X key. However, this camera rotation lag is caused by the smooth camera feature in the gameplay settings. If that option had been disabled, the camera would have rotated instantly. We can use a timeline to control the speed of the rotation. Let's make some changes to the blueprint to do this. Since the timeline has a start and end point, we need to create a variable to store the current rotation before the timeline starts. Now we can add a timeline. In the horror engine, the length of all existing timelines is set to one second. This is because the horror engine has a built-in function that allows you to quickly change the duration of any timeline. So I'm going to set the length of this one to one second as well, and I'll show you how to change it in the next step. Since the Z value we want to change is a float, we need to select the Add Float Track option, and we can call it something like Animation. Let's add two keyframes by left-clicking while holding down the Shift key. For the first keyframe, both of these values should be zero. For the second one, they should be one. This means that this float value will increase from zero to one in one second when the timeline starts playing. Optionally, you can select both and set key interpolation to auto to soften the beginning and ending movements. Now we need to link the set control rotation function to the update pin. This means that while the timeline is playing, the control rotation will be set on every frame. This time, instead of get control rotation, we should use the current rotation variable. Otherwise, the character's rotation speed will gradually increase during the transition. We will use the lerp function for the z value. If you ask what this function does, it provides a linear interpolation between values a and b, controlled by the alpha parameter ranging from 0 to 1. At alpha 0, it returns a, at alpha 1, it returns b, and intermediate values transition between a and b. In this case, we should link the current z rotation to the a pin, and the sum of the current z rotation with 180 to the b pin. As you can see, the character now rotates 180 degrees in one second. Let me show you how to change this duration. To do this, search for the play rate function and link the timeline component to it. Let's set this timeline to 0.25 seconds and see what happens. Personally, I found it a bit annoying that the rotation was always clockwise. To avoid this, we can make it random whether the rotation is clockwise or counterclockwise. The select utility we linked here will return 180 if the boolean is true and minus 180 if it is false. If we set this boolean with a random boolean before the timeline, the character will always rotate in a random direction. After this small modification, I think the movement now looks more natural. So what if I press the X button repeatedly? It seems that pressing this button again before the timeline is finished causes the timeline to restart. Let's fix that quickly as well. All we need is to make this run only one time with the help of the do once utility. And we can make it reset after the timeline is finished. From now on, once we press the X button, no matter how many times we press it again, it won't work until the timeline is finished. Now let me show you how to create a custom interaction, like use or alternative use for this input action. As I explained in the previous video, all the functions needed for interaction are built into the use blueprint. Let's create a new function and name it something like third use, and link it to a print string function to test it. Now we can link the input action to this function. To do this, go to the Horror Engine Blueprint, navigate to the input graph, and find the use and alternative use input actions. Before we go any further, let me give you the answer to how these interactions work. Here we can see that the use input action is linked to an event called use hit actor. 
Let's double click on it and see what this event does. The get usable macro you see here detects the actor the player is trying to interact with. The cast to use utility checks if the actor's parent class is use or not. The interaction enabled boolean checks if the actor is currently available for interaction. If all of these conditions are met, the use function executes for the actor. Now that we know this, let's create the same nodes for our new interaction. Just copy them all, paste them here, rename the event something like third use hit actor, and replace this use function with the third use function. Go back to the input graph and add the turnback input action, since we will be using the X key for now. As the last step, connect the third use hit actor event to it. To quickly summarize, pressing the X button will trigger this event. And if the necessary conditions are met, the third use function will be executed for the actor the player is trying to interact with. As a result, the string will be printed on the screen. Let's make sure everything is working properly. We made it, but there's a small problem, such as the X button executing the same print string function for all usable actors. This is because we add the print string to the third use function in the use blueprint, which is the parent class of all usable objects. Instead of designing the function here, we should design it specifically for each child class blueprint. Let's make this interaction print a different string for the radio and a different string for the old TV. All we need to do is add the event third use here and link it to a print string function. Let's do the same for old TV. In this way, you can design different things for each usable object's third use interaction. As a final example, let me quickly add some functionality for the radio instead of the print string. As a result of these, while the mouse buttons turn the radio on or off, or change its channel, the X button rotates it 180 degrees. And as you can see, the X button still prints a string to the screen when we interact with the old TV. In this video of the Horror Engine tutorial series, I've tried to guide you through the input settings in as much detail as possible. Please consider subscribing and I'll see you in the next video.